is real. He is real. He's real. The Lord God is real. Is he real to you? Is he real deep down in your soul? The God we serve is such an awesome and such an amazing God. He has blessed us again, and I just want to serve notice on you. He is real, and he ought to be real all deep down in your soul. And therefore, if he's real, we ought to act like he's real. We ought to serve him as if he is, he is real. In the New Testament, let me call your attention to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, one verse there, verse number six. John chapter 14. If you can stand, please stand for the reading of the word. This is the shortest reading you ever get, so you ought to stand for that one. John chapter 14, verse number 6. In the New Testament, the book is St. John. The chapter is 14. Verse is number 6. When you found it, you will discover these words. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to talk about Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Have you ever had bad news? Right. Have you ever had news that you really, really, really didn't want to hear? Have you ever gotten news that shattered your world, rocked your life, messed you up, caused your day to be upside down? Have you ever gotten news that caused you to think, God, where, are you, where are you? <laughs> Have you ever gotten news to ask the question, God, what are you doing up there? And then sometimes you can get one piece of bad news after the other. About time this get fixed, that shows up. By the time that shows up, something else gets in the mix. Have you ever just had what some folk call a bad day? Have you ever had what some folk call a bad week, a bad month, a bad year? Have you ever gotten to a point where you end your year and you're like, Lord, I looked forward to testifying for you. But God, I've had this string of stuff. Not just one thing. Not just 10 things, but 12 full months of stuff. Have you ever got news that is going to be here the rest of your life? You're just going to have to find some kind of way to deal with it. After you shake yourself, after you get past the initial shock of it all, you know you need to look to God. Have you ever gotten news that your best friend is going to leave you? Have you ever gotten news that the person that got you where you are in life is no longer going to be around? This is the situation in the text. Here in the text in John chapter 14, we usually use this text when there are funerals. 
and it can be appropriate for funerals, but the fact of the matter is we need to know what God is saying and what Jesus is doing before we get stressed out across here. Because sooner or later, regardless of how you built, how you shaped, and how well you are enduring, you're going to leave here. Sooner or later, your extensions won't be able to connect anymore. Sooner, sooner or later, your Max Carroll, your Mary Kay won't be enough. Sooner or later, your, your suits from New York won't make it. One of these days, life is going to turn for you upside down. I would like to be I would like to be like the like the prophetic preacher and tell you that life is going to be good for you the rest of your life but I won't stand here and lie to you. If you have not gotten to that moment where news has come to you and that news is bad news, just keep waking up in the morning. Sooner or later something is going to rock your world. It happened to me in the 8th grade. Young people, I was eighth grade, and I had all these A's, and I was just walking and, and enjoying life, and life was good. But there was one teacher that decided to give me an F that day, a flag, a waving flag. That just simply blew my mind. I, I couldn't fathom it. Not only did she drop down one letter, not only did she drop down two, three letters, she gave me the worst grade I could ever have. Let me tell you, that blew me. That, that rocked me. That shocked me. And it wasn't even a death sentence, but it just blew, it wiped me out. I had, to, I had to go and approach her. Miss <laughs> Clifford, what happened here? Miss right. <laughs> Clifford, let's look at this thing again. Miss Clifford, I, I, I know that the answers I put on the paper was right. But she had me to, to see that, but you didn't put the answers that I know is right. I walked away from that room. It wasn't the final exam, but I walked away from that room crushed. I walked away bewithered. I walked away discouraged. I walked away because I wasn't used to a flag waving at me. See, some people in my class, they were used to flags. Yes, sir. They showed up at the front door of the school with a flag. They left through the back door with a flag. They walked through the school, got out the car, walked through the school, got off the bus, walked through the front door and went out the back door. So they deserved a flag. But this flag in Miss Clifford English class was a devastating thing to me. The more devastating thing to me was she explained to me, you just got to live with it. I'm not going to retest you. I am not going to give you an opportunity to change your answers. But you're going to have to live with it. At my age, I was blown away. I act like it was the end. I thought it was the end. I was totally rejected that day. But when I got home, I had to try to explain these things. And as I, I stated my case... Mom and daddy saw my side for once in my life. Because I began to open up the book and I said, now this is the answer I gave and this is the answer. And they began to compare my answers with the book answer. I was set free by the homestead. But I had to live with that elf. Because I came up during a time where, where principals and teachers were never attacked by parents. It is what it is. You got to live with it. And now what you have to do is pull up that F. Right. But there was grace. And that grace is the two people that mattered saw my side of the deal. Amen. 
Such it is in the text. <laughs> the person who matters is God. Amen. And as long as God sees your side of the deal, Amen. it is all right with God. Amen. When you look at the text, when you look at the text, the, the pericope is, is from verses 1 through 6 and then also verse 7. We need to understand that Jesus has given them bad news. And if Jesus gives you bad news, there's some bad news going on. He says, he says to them, Jesus is talking and Jesus is saying to them, I am going to leave you. This man that walked with them for 33 and a half years that showed them miracles, that did one miracle after the other, that proclaimed himself to be God in the flesh. Jesus says to his best friends, his disciples, his apostles, that I got to leave you now. It's a lot more than mom and daddy going away for a job and coming back later on. It's a lot more than mom and daddy going off to service in the military and coming back. Jesus says, I have to leave you. And he goes on to say, not only am I leaving you, I'm going to die. For this day, Jesus is full of bad news. Have you ever been to church and, and the preacher got nothing but bad news? He says it's going to get worse before it gets better. It says that racism is all over the world and it has even invaded the United States of America. <laughs> when a preacher says that, that we are worse off in 2023 than we were in 1954, the preacher sometimes will give you bad news, but we ought to end it and let you know that there's some hope. And so that's what it does in the text. Jesus gives them bad news. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to die. And the next bad news, he says, and one of you all going to betray me. He says, the one that's been following me, the one that's going to dip in, in this food after me, he is going to sell me out. Have you ever had friends that sold you out? Have you ever had a friend that said, I'm going to be with you through thick and thin, and when the thin came in, they got thickly running? Jesus, Jesus says, Jesus says, one of you who've been walking with me, one of you who have seen the miracles, one after the other, you're going to sell me out. And he looks them dead in their eyes and says, it's one of you. Judas is sitting there and act like he's one of them and act like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Lord, is it I? Well. Lord, could I be the one that's going to do this? <laughs> he, says, he says, one of you going to sell us out. And then he says that even one of you in my inner circle is going to deny me and disown me. I'm talking about the inner circle of friendship. I'm talking about the inner circle of ministry. I'm talking about one who leaves Peter, you've gone to the mountain of transfiguration with me. You've seen me transform myself right there on the, on the mountain of transfiguration. You've seen my clothing in my, my countenance shine like brightness of light. But Peter, you're going to disown me. Peter, you are going to disappoint me. Peter, I just want to give you some more bad news. Peter, the devil has asked for you. Peter, the devil has asked to sift you like sifting wheat. But Jesus always has good news. He said, but I prayed for you. And you will be sustained. I prayed for you. Jesus shows up and he's full of bad news. He says, Peter, I know you say you love me. I know you say you would be with me. But the fact of the matter is, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, no, I love you, Lord. I, 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 I'll never do something like this. Jesus shows up full of bad news. By the time morning came, the rooster crowed. Peter had denied him. Not only had Peter denied him, he became known as cussing Peter. Are you a cusser in the church? He was, he, was a, a, he was a denying Peter. He was a disowning Peter. He was a cussing Peter. And when Peter started cussing, that girl left him alone. Some church folk have come to the conclusion that, 
my vocabulary pushes me and you push me. So he was cussing Peter. The devil had asked for him. Jesus says praying for him. So he had cussed and, and denied him three times. Then he goes on to say, Satan will work against you, disciples. I am sending you out as lamb, as sheep in the midst of wool and wolves, and Satan is going to work against you. Said to those of us who are disciples of God that there will come a day where Satan will push back on your ministry. You know you're doing the right thing. You know you're doing it the right way. But this journey called ministry is not an easy thing. It didn't take COVID to show up to let us know that ministry was hard. That's why I don't understand the hymnologist when the hymnologist says it. He says, I've been running for Jesus and I'm not tired yet. Let me just share with you. I've been running from Jesus and I'm tired. I've been running for Jesus and sometimes I get frustrated. I've been running for Jesus as Jesus promised. The devil works against that which is good. A particular pastor got up and he presented the, the vision. And I want to say to you next Sunday, you need to be here for the vision meeting. I just want to plug that in there. Everybody need to be here for the vision meeting because you, you understand that whenever there's vision cast, you ought to be here to hear it for yourself so you can support the vision. One particular pastor gets up and he, he presents the vision and he tells the people how God has blessed him and how long he's been praying for this vision. And one guy stands up and he said, I'm getting it. He's against it. He said, I'm getting it. I'm against it. He says, I'm against it. So, so there was another wise preacher in the audience. He said, well, why are you against it? I'm just against it. I don't believe in it. I don't believe it's of God. I'm just against it. So the preacher says, the second preacher says to the pastor, he said, Pastor, you say you've been praying over this. How long you been praying? He said, I've been praying over this for the last three years. So he turns and looks at the brother that's against it, and he says, how long you been praying for? He said, I just heard it a while ago. Well, if he been praying for three years, you just heard it a while ago. Well, why are you against it? But we have to understand that the devil wants to use us. And the devil is going to work against us. And the devil is real. We sing the song, God is real, Jesus is real. He's real down in our soul, but the devil is real also. And the devil is mighty, but don't concern yourself with the mightiness of the devil. Because God is almighty. And regardless of what the devil does, God is able to keep him at bay. The Bible says when the devil comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against him. The Bible says no weapon against us shall prosper. It didn't say that the weapons won't come against you. But it did say if the weapons come against you, it will not prosper. Oh, that day, Miss Clifford gave me that elf. That had been more than 50 years ago. I'm, th I'm still thinking about Inanola Junior High School. <laughs> I'm still thinking about eighth grade. I could have let that devastate me the rest of my life. I could have walked out there and said, I'm dumb and I couldn't make it. But in the end, when I look back at my report card, even with this S on this F on this one assignment, I ended up with an A in the whole class. Let me tell you, God is able to keep the devil at bay. God is able to shut the devil down. God is able to make things come out all right. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Stick with it. God is able to bless you. In the text, Jesus shows up with all this bad news. And the interesting thing about this bad news, he's not talking about worldly folk. He's talking about Christians. Talking about church folk. Talking about Christians. Talking about those who had been with him for several years. Those who had walked with him. Those who know what he's all about. He's saying, you are, you are going to betray me. 
you are going to disown me. You are going to mess with me. And you are going to let the devil sabotage your ministry. That is all bad news. So when we look at chapter 14 of John, they are contemplating, thinking about, and looking at all this bad news. So they are troubled. Jesus speaks to them and said, let not your heart be troubled. He says, your heart, your heart are your thoughts. Your heart is your desires. Your heart is your passions. Your heart is your spirit. Your heart is your very inner being. He says, don't let it be troubled. Bad news is going to come to us. We might as well come to the conclusion, bad news is going to show up. And it's going to have the right house. <laughs> You can prophesy all in the name of Jesus. You can pray all in the name of Jesus. But bad news knows your doorbell number. Bad news knows your ring doorbell. Bad news knows your address, your Twitter account. Bad news certainly knows your Facebook account. What you have to understand is that if you have bad news, you got to do it like Jesus done it. You have to go to the person and let them know what you know. You can't do it. You can't do it like some of us do on social media now. What we do on social media, somebody did us wrong, then we post stuff saying, you thought you had me. I don't know what you're talking about. You thought you were going to get by with doing me wrong. I, you talking to the whole world and the world didn't do you wrong. You've come to the conclusion that you can get back at somebody by ignoring them but then blasting it all over the world. Don't blast it. Show up at the doorstep and let's confront each other. Let's deal with it. Matthew chapter 18 says like this. If you have aught with your brother, go to him one on one. Get it straight. And if you can get it straight, you want a brother or a sister. And then it says, if you don't have, if you are not able to fix it, take two or three others with you. And when you take two or three others with you, you ought to be able to get it right. If you cannot fix it, then bring it before the church. That's Bible. But you need to understand that there's a process that you have to go through. And it's not overnight. It's a long, drawn-out process before you come before the church. And then when you take two people with you or three people with you, you don't take your friends, your dog, your buddies. You take somebody who's in the word, who will walk with you in the word, who will bless you through the word, simply because you don't want anybody to be tainted by your relationship with them. The Bible says, go to them. Talk to them about it. Don't wait. Just make sure you pray before you go. Because some people know how to get you off them, get you off them, get you off them, and it will damage your whole relationship. I told you last week, you don't need to be into it with all your neighbors. You, you, don't, need, you don't need people that, that can't depend on you to say the right thing and do the right thing. You ought to pray about it. You ought to think it through. You ought to make sure you do the things that are of God. And when you do those things which are of God, you need to make sure that you do it God's way. So Jesus goes to them. He tells them, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to die. Now they're discouraged. Down they're busted and disgusted. And Jesus comes up and he says, let not your heart be troubled. Amen. Jesus has dumped a heavy weight on them. Have you ever had just a heavy weight on you? Have you ever gone to the doctor and the doctor said, I know you're having pains, but I can't find it? It's usually because we have nerve issues. It's usually because we stressed out about something. It's usually because we don't have any way of getting over what news we've just heard. And we come to the conclusion, I'm not stressed. There's nothing going on with me. Yeah, there's something going on with everybody. There's something going on with the preacher. There's an attitude about all of us, and we're in situations that we don't want to be in. But we got to look to Jesus. Jesus says, be not troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. He says, whatever you do, trust the God who made you. 
whatever you do, trust the God who gave you another chance. Whatever you do, trust the God that woke you up this morning. Whatever you do, make sure that you look to God when trouble hits. Amen. And let me just share with you, don't wait till trouble hit because trouble is on its way. We are even in three states when it comes to trouble. One or three states, or some of us in all three states. We're coming out of trouble. We're in trouble right now. Or we're headed for trouble. That's why you can't wait to get in the church. It, it, really, it, really, it really amazes me how people cannot claim a church home. And then when a loved one expires, they want to make sure that they have a church. A woman said to me, said to me she, she goes about three times a year. Her, her, her son passed away that never went to church or never goes to church, doesn't have a church home. She says, I want to leave him and lay him in stake for five hours so his friends can come and view him. Says, well, sister, this is not the church to do it. It's not being mean. It's the fact that laying him in stake for five hours is not going to bring him back. Laying him in stake for five hours will not save his soul. You have to make the decision of where you want your soul to end before they stretch you out across here. Before you expire, before you leave here, for Hebrew says that there is appointed to every man, every woman, every child a period of death. Is appointed to every man a time to die. Is appointed to every child, every woman, a time to die. And after death, here comes the judgment. Therefore, you can't make any decisions on your spiritual life after you're dead. Matter of fact, who wants to take the chance? Anybody in the room want to take a chance on, on once you're dead and you're done, that I'm going to make my life in, in heaven? Let me tell you, it's not worth the chance. Matter of fact, it's not worth the chance today to walk out this room. Because we don't know the time nor the day we're going to get out of here. Jesus says, believe in God. You need to believe in him today. The reason why this pericope is so important before funerals is because you can make your decision before you get here. One of these days, my tongue will cleave to the roof of my mouth. One of these days, they will fold my hand in service for the very last time. One of these days, my wedding band, more than my class ring, will never make a difference. One of these days, it doesn't matter where I live, whether my, my, I live in an apartment or a house, whether I live in a gated community, it doesn't matter whether my Facebook page is up to date or not. One of these days, without any warning, we're going to leave here. Because every day of your life, you are sick enough to die. At your best, you are sick enough to leave here. The fact is, you don't have to be sick to leave here. You can be a picture of health. Doctors are bewildered. Doctors are amazed because some people were running marathons in good shape, and they run marathons every single year, and they have their doctor's appointment, and their blood pressure is, is lower than one, 100, and they still leave here. When we leave here, it's not left up to us. And you don't have to be a gangster to get out of here. You don't have to be a dope dealer to get out of here. Matter of fact, you can be sitting in this room. You can leave here right now. I'm just giving you some bad news. But he goes on to say, Jesus says in verse number, number two, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, in my father's house, this word mansion translates rooms. And what, what the idea here is, is God has a big home. God has a mansion, and everybody who's born again, everybody who's saved, God has a room in his mansion reserved for you. The word better translate to be many rooms. So the idea is you ought not be living with mama now if you're full grown, but when you leave here, you can live with God when you're full grown. Right. The fact is God doesn't have any grown children. 
We are just God's children. And because we are God's children, we ought to obey God. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. When you are saved, when you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, when you are born again, Jesus prepares a room, a mansion for you, and it's just your style. If I don't live in a mansion down here forever, it's all right. I'm going to live in a mansion over there from now on. My stuff's going to be left. Sister David's going to roll it all out and bring some new stuff in. Just got to be real. And she's already told me, Sister Henry, I better not die in that house. <laughs> Brother Damien, she said, if I die in that house, guess what's going to happen? That day is going up for sale. That day, y'all can have anything in there. <laughs> Brother Orr, she says, the day I die, if I die in that house, is over. And some of y'all feel the same way. You're just not telling me about it. <laughs> so Sister says she got too much invested in that house. She said her boo can come by to visit and die over there if he wants to. She just got a dead boo that they gonna, she going to call the corner. He's going to roll her out. Now, I don't know how that translates, but... <laughs> We're going to leave here. We got to go. We're going to die. Yes, sir. Jesus says, I'm, Jesus says he's going to die. We might as well prepare our children. We might as well prepare our friends. We got to leave here. Amen. We get, the doctor said, the doctors, nine doctors said, said, gather the family up and talk to them. So since I'm the one they depend on, I gather the whole family up, and I say, Daddy has lived a good life. One of the family members said, look, man, you called the meeting too soon. I said, man, nine doctors said we need to call a meeting. He said, well, did you see, did you see how people were, were laughing and talking before you called the meeting? And then when you called the meeting, everybody was crying? Well, that's just a matter of reality setting in. And when we initially hear the first news, the reality sets in. And when the re reality sets in, then what we have to do is make sure we absorb the shock. So you don't need to wait till the doctor tells you to call a meeting. You need to call a meeting anyway. Matter of fact, you ought to have a will. Tell them whether you want to be cremated or, or buy one of those expensive pieces of ground down there. Or, or I mean, ground now is $4,000. Five thousand, and if you want to be under the tree where the sun won't won't burn you, it can go up to ten thousand dollars. Oh, you know she never liked hot hot, so we gonna bury her under the tree. Let me just serve notice on you. It doesn't matter where you buried. It doesn't matter whether they cremate or whether they put you in the ground six feet under. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. You ought to get it together before you leave. Prepare your people now, cause you got to leave here. Jesus sets a good example that we're going to leave here one day. And that's why we ought to act like we're leaving every day. Pastor Shook, Fellowship of, of the Woodlands, writes this book. What if you know that you're going to die in 30 days? What would you change? If you had 30 days to live, who would you get things right with? Because those 30 days turn to 30 seconds quickly. What would you do differently? What kind of attitude would you have if you knew you had 30 days to live? Where would you travel? What would you do? Who would you hang out with if you knew you had 30 days to live? Who would you stop giving the side eye and rolling your neck at if you knew you had 30 days to live? Because everything we do, everything we say will be brought into the judgment. And if you have 30 days to live, I want you to start living like this. 
Act like you got 30 seconds to live. So how would you handle things if you know you have 30 seconds to live? Every day you wake up, I got 30 seconds, Lord, and I thank you for those 30 seconds, Lord. Now let me hurry up and get it right. Let me hurry up and get it right with you. Let me hurry up and get it right with others because I know, Lord, you've given me 30 seconds, and that is a privilege to have 30 seconds. Who would you go back and apologize to? As we take communion, Sister Davis read the scripture where Jesus says, for as often as you do this, you show forth your, my death and suffering until I come again. Before you take communion, you need to get your heart right. Because the Apostle Paul says some people ate like they were eating a full course meal. They ate with the wrong motive. They ate with the wrong focus. They, they carried out stuff. Lord, deliver me from folk that got to carry out something every time we eat. I stopped a brother in the hallway this years ago. He, he's not here, so stop looking around. He had seven plates in a garbage bag. First of all, I wouldn't want to put my plate in a garbage bag because it's not a sterile garbage bag. I said, man, what, what you doing with two people at your house? You trying to feed the community? What we have to understand is we have to change our ways now because God is coming. And he is coming to do some things through the church and with the church. We got to change our thoughts. We have to change our ways. We have to change who we hang out with and where we hang out. We have to make sure that we understand that God has a prepared place for a prepared group of people. He says, and if I go away, in other words, since I'm going away, if I go away to prepare for you this place, I will come again and receive you to myself, unto myself. I am coming to receive you. And he's not talking about receiving you in the general resurrection. He's talking about receiving you when Jesus Christ cracks the sky. The trump of God will sound. The voice of the archangel will sound. And Jesus will stop in midair. And those of us who are saved... Those of us who are born again will rise first. If we're born again, we will rise first. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place. We can count on Jesus' promise. He, he says, we have a place that we're going to. And you can count on my promise. If I'm leaving you now, don't be troubled. I'm going to leave, but I'm coming back again. He also says, God bless these as I'm going. And he also says, make sure, God, you send the Holy Spirit that he will comfort them as I leave you. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is sent, then he will, he will repeat or he will remind you of the things that I have promised you. He says, I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go, since I'm going, and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. That where I am, he already speaking in present and future tense. That where I am, there you will be also. When God saves us, we're already in heavenly places. Paul says in Galatians, he says that, that God has placed us in heavenly places. If we're already in heavenly places, we need to start acting like heavenly people. We have to deliver the gospel and not the gospel. We have to share with people the love of Christ and not the hatred of man. We got to get past racism. I know it's real. I'm from Mississippi. I saw it. I experienced it. I know it's real, but I can't let it become a handcuff to me or a shackle to me. We got to get past it because God loves all people. Matter of fact, the folk that some people are mad at are not the folk that were present. They've gone on and God has already given them their just reward. We have to understand that Jesse Jackson was right. Red, yellow, black and white, they are all precious in God's sight. And because we all precious, we got to live together in this entire universe. 
We got to make a difference in other people's lives because what goes around comes around. You mistreat somebody else's children, you can bet the devil going to make sure that somebody's going to mistreat yours. If you neglect somebody else's children, the devil will make sure that somebody neglect yours. We have to walk with God. And as we walk with God, we understand that we have a, a mansion. Just our style. A room that's set aside just for us. And because we have this room set aside for us, the Bible says after death comes the judgment, and that judgment, God will give you just what you deserve. Every idle word will be brought into your remembrance. Every idle word will be brought into the judgment. Everything you've thought, everything you've seen, everything that, every way you have acted will be brought into the judgment. Jesus is laying on some bad news. He said that I, the good news is I receive you unto myself, and where I am, you will be also. Verse, no, verse number four says, where I go, you will know. Where I go, you know, and the way you will know or the way you know. Thomas, boy, y'all sure are bad on Thomas. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Everybody called Thomas Doubting Thomas. But get off Thomas. Leave Thomas alone. Because I see some Doubting Marys, some Doubting Joannes. Some dying carters. Some I see some doubters. Leave Thomas alone because we doubt too. I see some doubting Davises. We doubt also. Thomas says, how can we know where you're going and how can we know the way? Jesus answers this famous answer that all Christians know well. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus says, I am the way. If you're really looking for the way, if you really want to know the way, just understand this, I am the way. He says, I am the way. I am the way. This word way means that I am the road. I am the map. This word way means that I am so satisfied with you knowing for sure that I am the route that you need to take. I am the road. He says, I am the road. I am the road. And because I'm the way, the truth, and the life, you need to follow me. He says, I am the way. I'm the truth. And I'm the life. This word way means you don't need a GPS. Man, GPS can really frustrate me. I mean, I spend most of my time saying, I ain't doing that. No, I, 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 have, I have the ability to look to see where the checkered flag is on my GPS. And when I look and see the checkered flag, and then I back up into my route, I see that this GPS is taking me around every red light, taking me by every stop sign, and then it puts me on 610 when I need to get on 45, and that's okay, but don't take me all the way to the Cypress to put me on 45. And that's what GPS does. I'm so glad that Jesus is the way. I'm so glad that GPS is not the way, and it's because there's somebody looking from the sky, and they don't have a bird's eye view. But the God we serve, He's in the skybox. He is the one who sees everything. Let me just break the skybox down for some of you. Whenever you see somebody on the football field, there's a person. It may be the offensive coordinator in the, in the skybox. He's looking down on the field, and he can see what the coaches on the sideline cannot see. And they, he can tell them, well, head coach, you're down there, but I can see what you don't see. And because I can see what you don't see, don't run this play. They are setting up for this play. 
And then sometimes the quarterback comes and he stands there, and when he gets behind the center, he begins to call what is known as an audible. And that audible is when the quarterback has the ability and he takes that responsibility of changing the play in the middle of the play. Before the ball is snapped, after the whistle is blown, he's able to change the play. And he's not changing the play just so he can run the ball. He's changing the play because there's a person in the skybox that got an earplug in the coach's ear and the coach sends a signal out and now they have this sophisticated stuff where the coach, the coach will change the play and the quarterback has the ability to change the play even if he doesn't get the coach's communication. I stop by to tell you, we have a God who sits in heaven. He looks down on earth and this God is changing the plays for us in real time. He changed, he's changing the play. He's changing the play. We think one way. We want to do it one way. We have already, and you ought to sit down and you ought to line out your whole life. You ought to lay out your whole life. You ought to present your whole life. You ought to look ahead. Every day you ought to plan for the week. Every day you ought to plan. Uh, you ought to plan for the year. You ought to plan for the month. You ought to plan. You ought to make a plan. But after you make the plan and before you make the plan, you ought to take your plan before God. Because God has a way of changing the way in the midst of your plans. We have to know that Jesus is the way. And when we discover that Jesus in the way is the way, we ought to follow that way. The next thing he says is that I am the truth. He says, I am the truth. This word true is true. He is the true word. He is the true word. He is the word. Don't go and become a black Israelite because you're black. Let me say that again. Don't go and become a black Israelite just because you're black. One girl says she went to Israel, and, uh, and a guy talked to her for a few minutes and said to her, well, you know, y'all people don't know what y'all are and who y'all are. Let me tell you, Big Mama would say it like this, the same horse that brought me over the bridge is the same horse that's going to take me behind the bridge and over the bridge again. We need to understand that Jesus is the way and Jesus is the truth. Confucius don't compare to Jesus. Aristotle doesn't compare to Jesus. Muhammad doesn't compare to Jesus. Jesus is the way and he is the truth. Stick with Jesus, you will get there. Finally, he says, I am the life. He says that I am the life. I am the life. This life is twofold. This word life, first of all, is physical life. If you want to have a fruitful life, stay with Jesus. If you want to have a life that is abundantly fruitful, stay with Jesus. Don't doubt him, even when you don't get to your way. Stay with Jesus because Jesus is the life. Not only is he the life, he's the light. And because Jesus is the life, you better stay with him because he makes life better on this side. Life is easy. Life is easy when you don't buck Jesus. <laughs> life is easy when you stay with Jesus. Now, we don't have an easy life because we came to Jesus. Somebody lied to you and said, if you just come to Jesus, your life will be different and you won't have any more problems. Somebody said to me, since I've been with Jesus, I had nothing but problems. But it's good to have Jesus on the boat with you when you're going through your turbulent situations. Stay with Jesus, regardless of what comes up, regardless of how the waves are, regardless of how the wind blows, stay with Jesus. The songwriter says, my soul is anchored in the Lord. You need to stay with the Lord. We're seeing things in our world today that we've never seen before. We've seen people give their lives to a man. We've, we've seen people that, that I know the Sunday school class has gone back and they've Googled They've Googled Beyonce's church. I, I know it. Wednesday night, I told you that they have a, a church that deals with Beyonce. It's called the Beyonce Church. And, and when they sing the music, they sing Beyonce music in the church. And, and the church is packed out. It is full. It looks nothing like this. I mean, it is full of thousands upon thousands of people. They show up to show women 
how to be good to themselves and how to think well of themselves. It is designed to show African American in and brown-skinned and Hispanic women that they are special to God. Let me just serve notice. You don't need Beyonce nor her music to tell you how special you are to God. God has physically made you. He has spiritually made you. He's emotionally made you. God has made you who you are. You don't need Beyonce nor her music to tell you who you are. You need to make sure you understand that the truth is in God's word. God gives life through his word. That's why we're reading the word. That's why we're listening to the word. That's why the word is priority. We're not a Baptist church. We're not a Methodist church. We are a word church. And because we walk in the word, we ought to stay in the word. Because the word is God's truth. Jesus is truth. So the second thing he talks about in life not only is he life physically, he's life spiritually. Amen. The same Jesus who's the way, the truth, and the life, he teaches how to live our lives here spiritually, and he guarantee us life spiritually on the other side. Amen. And let me tell you, when we get to the other side, well. when we get to the other side, you think you praise him down here? We're going to sure enough praise him over there. It won't be dependent on whether you are introvert or extrovert. You're going to praise him because of who he is and what he's already done. He is God, and we're going to get to know him. Jesus says, I am the life. No man come to the Father except through me. Jesus says in, in Romans chapter 10 that I am the door to the sheepfold. No one comes in to the Father except through me. He says, I'm the door. If you're going to get to God, you got to go through Jesus. If you're going to get to the Father, you got to go through the Son. He says, not only does he say in, in verse number 6 that no man comes to the Father except through me, verse number 7 ends like this. And he says in this final part of this pericope, if you have known me, you would have known my Father also. If you have known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. He says to those of us who are saved, those of us who are born again, if we see Jesus, he is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the hypostatic union. This word, hypostatic union, means that Jesus is just as much God as God and just as much man as man. He's wound up in one person, Jesus the Christ. There will never be another man like Jesus. John says in John 3 and 16, John declares that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This word begotten means only beloved son. This word begotten simply means one of a kind son. There is no one like Jesus. So stop putting people on a pedestal and just look to Jesus. Because if you put people on a pedestal, they are going to let you down. And you will have a great big fall if you put people on a pedestal. One reason why I didn't want to preach is, number one, I didn't like the pedestal that the people put the preacher on. But I found out at New Beginning Church they don't do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just thought I'd put that in there. I, I just thought I'd let you know that, that at the New Beginning Church, I'm just one of y'all. So the first reason I didn't want to preach because I didn't like the pedestal that the people put the preacher on. And so God sent me to a church that I don't have to sit there and I don't even have to worry about it. I don't even have to think about it. Matter of fact, Sister Davis, I don't even have to pray about it. It is what it is. Thank God. Second reason that I didn't want to preach was I didn't like the pedestal that the preacher put himself on. If you ever try to deal with a bunch of preachers, you got something on your hand. I mean, I, was, I didn't want to do this, Brother Miles, and you saw it. I didn't want to do this.
because I didn't like the pedestal that the people put the preacher on. I didn't like the pedestal that the preacher put him his arrogant self on. And the third reason is that I didn't want, I didn't want the devil to come after me with both valves. I didn't want the devil. Jesus says it. Jesus says the devil is going to sift you. He's looking to sift you like sifting wheat. I, I was fine. Junior deacon, do my thing on Sunday, live for the Lord during the week, I'm good. And that's why I say to every brother that think that they want this spot, if you think God has called you to this spot, it's all right with me. It's all right. It's, it's just fine because it's not as glamorous as it looks. It's not as rewarding as it looks. The only reward that we can guarantee ourselves that working for the Lord pays off after a while. And only what you do for God will last. And only what you do for God will pay off. He says, if you have seen me, Jesus is talking, if you've seen me in the flesh, you've seen me in the spirit, you, you've also seen him, you've seen God. Because Jesus is God in the flesh. And you often wonder, why I need to talk to somebody? Let me tell you, if you got issues, they got licensed folk for you. They've studied well. They've gone through things. If you got, if you got issues, you need to go see somebody who's qualified to handle your issues. And many times, you come to the pastor, I'm just not qualified because some of us got some issues that the pastor ain't qualified to handle. So go see a professional that can do it. Make sure you get you a Christian professional. Somebody who loves the Lord. Somebody that's going to turn you to the truth of God's word. But go see somebody. Don't wait till things get overwhelming to you. And if you come to me and I can't handle it, I'm glad to send you to somebody who can and who will. And it has nothing to do with my ego. It's not a bad mark on me anyway. It would be a worse mark if I tried to handle your stuff and mess your stuff up. So go to see a professional. Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. If you've seen the, me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is saying to us, don't be troubled. Don't be discouraged. Lift up your head. Stay with the word. The word can fix our issues. Only God's word can handle what we go through. And you're not the only person going through what you're going through. People go through what you're going through every day. They're just not talking about it. Uh, don't get into a pity party. Oh, woe is me. Don't get to a point where you think that you're the only person who have this thing going on. Everybody got something going on with them. In the church, we just cover it well. We put on long stuff. We put on snug stuff. We put on extension stuff. We put on mask and makeup, and we cover it well. But we can cry in the middle of the night because stuff is going on with us. Make sure you stay with Jesus. He is a great physician. If the woman with the issue of blood showed up today, she would tell you, for 12 long years I was messed up. I was hemorrhaging for 12 long years, and I didn't even have to touch Jesus. I just touched the hem of his garment, and my flow dried up. If the man that was living in the graveyard showed up, he would tell you I was out of my mind. I was mentally crazy. But when I got to Mark chapter 5, verse number 6, Jesus shows up, I run to him, and now I'm clothed in my right mind. If Lazarus was here, he would say that, that I was dead and I was on my way out of here. I was already rotten, but Jesus showed up. And when Jesus showed up, he resurrected me. And somebody in this room can testify that the doctor had given me a death sentence, but I took it to Jesus and, and he healed my body and, and he gave me, Jesus gave me a new lease on life. It's because Jesus can fix it. And he fixes it every time. That same Jesus saw us on our way to hell. 
We were broken, busted, and disgusted. We were on our way to hell. We needed a savior. We couldn't get to God and God couldn't get to us. But over 2,000 years ago, on a skull hill called Calvary, Jesus gave up the ghost, I tell you. Jesus died. They stretched him wide. They dropped him low. They held him high. He died on Calvary, I tell you. He died for you and he died for me on a skull hill called Calvary. He died, I tell you. They took him off the cross, laid him in a barber tomb. They laid my Lord and, and your God in a barber tomb, I tell you. It was a barber tomb because he didn't need it too long. All of that third day morning, he rose with all power. He rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He got up real early in the morning. Before the rooster would crow, he got up. Before Pilate could change the God, he got up early that third day morning. And Jesus says, I'm leaving now. But I'm coming back again. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that he's coming back at the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in midair. In the text of class, we will forever be with the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I'm looking forward to that day where I won't have an organ, where I won't have a piano, where I don't need a drum, where I don't need a good talk. I'm looking forward to the day where the kingdom of God I'm in the midst of it, and I can praise him all the day long. I'm looking for the day. So if I don't get up in the morning, it's all right. If I don't speak to you anymore, it's all right. I'm on my way to the other side. I don't care if you call McCoy and Harrison. I don't care if you call Richardson. I don't care if you call any undertaker. I don't care if you go down the street to Wells. I want you to know that I'm out of here anyway. And I will forever be with the Lord. Crying holy, holy, holy. Blessed is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah to the Lamb. His name is Jesus, the righteous Son of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Lord, we glorify you. We bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you've already, what you've already done. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. Just as you are. I had to come to him and I was just like the songwriter. I was weary. I was warm. I was wounded. And I was sad. But in Jesus, I found a resting place. And he has made me glad you ought to try him today if you've never tried Jesus Christ if you've not invited him in your life as your savior this is your moment you ought to come right now if you've never received Jesus as your savior please bow your head with me and come right now say Lord Jesus I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. If you're here today and you don't have a church home, I recommend to you the New Beginning Church. Where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. The door is open. Foxes have holes, that's their home. Birds have nests, that's their home. Every person needs a church home. The door is open. Will you come? 
if you struggle with sin like I do, and I like Paul every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. We want to pray with you, pray for you. You can come now. As the choir sings and the people are praying, the doors open. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Yes. Just the door is open. Will you try Jesus? Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Just now. Come to Jesus. 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 Just now. Just now. Just now. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Just now. Father, we thank you, Father, for who you are. Jesus, we thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God.